Hey everyone, um, just wanted to do a really quick video on path tracing and on render settings that we used specifically for alpha. Um, sorry if my voice is pretty nasty, I'm getting over COVID, so it was, uh, yeah, starting to feel human again. Um, but yeah, so I'll keep this short. As you see, we got like a nice shot from our alpha piece. Um, right now I'm in path racing through the anamorphic camera plugin. I'll throw that link in the uh, description again. Um, you know, you can see the difference between lit mode and path tracer already just in the viewfinder. You know, if I hop out of the camera and go up to the reflections on these cars, I mean, this is path trace. You see a lot of nice ambient lighting and bouncing on the paint. And if I go to lit mode, all that just kind of gets crushed and you pretty much lose it. So I think with automotive work, path tracing is pretty key. It does obviously kind of take away all the beauty of real time, but I think the workflow with real time is really the, you know, where it shines because you get to enjoy the process and see what you're doing the whole time and see the lighting. Because I mean, to be able to work in this and render out shots that look like this for just previs sake is so sick. It's incredible. So path tracing is kind of just the chef's kiss, in my opinion, for automotive work, just to get the ambient lighting and the, the reflections and all that. I think, I mean, the bokeh looks better, but yeah, it's definitely time consuming on the render side of things. But yeah, sorry, I'll keep this to the point for some render settings for path tracer, because I know it's sometimes a bit confusing. There's a little tip is a command that you can uh, type in right here called r.pathtracing dot progress display space one and when you turn that on hit enter it uh, it's just pretty self-explanatory it shows a progress bar for that frame as it's rendering all the samples in that frame which i think is just super helpful to see subconsciously and it should save your console commands after you save your project so what you saw me do i just hit up on my keypad when i'm in the uh, console command down here and all my different codes that i've been messing with are here so I already had progress display right there. Quickly go over some path trace settings. Um, this translate for the main Cine camera as well as the anamorphic plugin. Basically you would click your camera, go to your details panel, search path, and you get all of your path trace settings. I'll go down the line, max bounces. It's essentially how many times the light is gonna bounce off materials in your image. We usually just kind of leave it at 20. I don't notice a massive difference when we shoot it up to 50 or, or bring it down to 10. I think we just have found that 20 seems to be a nice middle ground. Um, you know, if you put zero, it's going to be dark because you have no light bouncing off of anything. Um, so we've found that 20 is just a nice middle ground, not a do or die setting if you play around with it, see what looks better. I don't think you're going to notice much after 10 to 15. You won't notice too many differences depending on your scene. Moving down samples per pixel. This is the biggest, you know, and the most important setting for path tracer in camera. Obviously once you render, you're going to have to do it again in the render settings, which I'll show you. But while you're working samples per pixel is essentially what it is. Like how many, path trace samples per pixel are you going to render? So if you put, you know, 30, you'll see my progress bar shoots up, turn off denoiser, and you'll see how sparkly it is. It's just simply because there's not enough samples. So it's a super grainy image. As you crank this up, render time goes up exponentially. But you know, if you're working in 500, You'll see how much slower it is and i'm on a 3090 ti so it goes pretty quickly and also again the anamorphic camera is slower um, but let's see what this looks like when it's done so with 500 without my denoiser on because denoiser kind of crushes everything you can see on the hood i'm still a bit sparkly so i think minimum for some high quality renders should be 1024 it's going to take a while um, as you can see but we did a, we did a lot of our renders at 1024 some we actually did at 2048 but this anamorphic camera 
like I said, doubled our render time. So we were pretty much locked to doing 1024 with our timeline because 2048 was going to take like two minutes of frame on renders at 1080p. So it was just too much. Moving down to filter width. Again, when you hover over these, they explain them, which is great. Um, this is essentially the anti-aliasing filter width for Path Tracer. Um, we never change this. We just leave it at checked on at default three. Seems to be solid. Um, feel free to play around with it if you think it makes your image look better or worse, but three default seems to be great for us. Emissive materials. This essentially just makes sure Path Tracer sees emissive materials. Um, you know, whether you have headlights or anything that's emissive, Path Tracer is going to not show it if you don't have that on. So, you know, I say always keep that on. Most of the time you're going to have something that's emissive, some kind of ambient lighting. Big one, Mac, Max Path Exposure. This one, default, is set to 30. And what this is doing is essentially that is the exposure value for the actual samples that it's creating. And so for a long time, all my renders had these massive fireflies, super spicy fireflies across the image, as you can see right now. And I was stuck and I got a tip, thankfully, to turn that down to two or three. And that essentially limits the exposure of my samples and it matches your scene a lot better. And that immediately took away my fireflies and yeah, it was honestly a life-saving tip for all my renders. On a current project we're on, we've turned it to zero, but what we learned is that that totally shuts down any emissive headlight. So you lose your bloom and you lose your flares. So we've been experimenting with turning it up a little bit to like five to 10 if we need headlights. Um, but that was, that's still a working experiment. But for alpha, we kept it at three and it looked great. Reference depth of field essentially is just enabling like really high quality depth of field in layman's terms. Um, the anamorphic camera has its own setting for that. So this kind of is obsolete with anamorphic, but with the main camera, definitely make sure you have that checked on. And a denoiser. This one is a love-hate relationship, I'd say. Um, it does incredible work, but it does it a little bit too intense. We kept it on for all of Alpha, and I think that is the reason that a lot of the shots look a little bit plasticky and shiny, if you noticed. It's because it it's almost smoothing it out too much, and it makes things just look just like super, super shiny and perfect because I don't have any control over turning it down to like 50% denoise. But what it does is it eliminates any other artifacting and, you know, spiciness and fireflies. So it does an incredible job at that, but it's it's also, what it's doing is it's denoising individual frames and individual samples uniquely. Which means if you have a low sample count, like 250 or something, each frame is gonna have a different look to the denoise. So you're gonna have this weird kind of heat wave distortion because there's no uh, cohesiveness. There's no uh, consistency across the denoise. It's not denoising all the frames together as a moving image. It's denoising them one by one by one by one differently every time. To bypass that kind of heat wave look, you really have to crank your samples up quite high to at least like 1024. So for alpha, we had 1024 samples denoised on in all of these settings. To take that into a render, I'll do a quick you know, example of just a basic, basic ProRes render or EXR. You drag your sequence into your movie render queue, which should come stock with UE5. If it's not showing, you just go window, cinematics, movie render queue and this window will come up. Drag your sequence in. I'm clicking my settings. And let's clear this. We did an EXR sequence 
and I'll keep this kind of simple. You know, you could choose whatever output you want. Um, a lot of our previs, you know, we're doing ProRes, so it translates. Say we want to do a ProRes for basic, you know, QuickTime file. You do ProRes, then you come down to Deferred Rendering Path Tracer. Don't need to touch any of that. Come in, throw anti-aliasing down. And I'm not gonna get into any crazy detail of like console commands or anything for this render. I'm just gonna do a very basic path trace setting. Um, so this isn't like the ultimate highest, highest quality render or anything like that, but it is gonna get you knowing how to handle path tracer in the render. So the sample count comes out in anti-aliasing, which is confusing. Basically, this camera setting over here, the samples per pixel that we were talking about, gets wiped out and redone by the anti-aliasing setting. And it comes into play by the multiplication of your spatial sample count and your temporal sample count. So, for example, for 1024 samples, you're gonna have to set this to 32 by 32 and you'll get this warning and just override anti-aliasing and leave it at that. So now this is essentially rendering 1024 samples because 32 times 32. Say you wanted 500, you do 10 times 50 and that's gonna produce 500 samples per pixel. We're st I'm still experimenting with what looks best for you know motion blur and stuff. But for example, for like 2048 samples, we were doing a higher number up here. We were doing 64 by 32, and that looks great. For ten, that's 2048 samples per pixel. Um, you know, 256 would be 16 by 16. But yeah, so essentially, this multiplication is what gives you your samples per pixel. I think that's the biggest thing you need to remember. <coughs> Excuse me. And for alpha coming out at 1024, we left this at 32 by 32. Exactly like that. And you'd come to your output, click these three dots to kind of pick where you want it. File format, I didn't change. I would just leave that my sequence name. And your output resolution, we had to leave these at 1920 by 1080 just for render time. And didn't do a custom frame rate. I mean, you can set this to whatever you need. 23.976. And yeah, this right here is a very basic ProRes path traced 1024 sample render with no additional hectic, you know, console commands for motion blur quality and anything like that. Um, sometimes we've thrown this, I don't fully understand it, this camera setting and leaving at frame center this sometimes cleans up motion blur, but I don't really want to uh, claim that right now because I don't fully grasp it yet, but I'm still learning. But yeah, what you could do here is then, you know, save as a preset, type it what you would want, put it in a folder, and then that way, <coughs> excuse me, and then that way you can access it and quickly, you know, throw it down. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I believe that's it for very, very top level basics for Path Tracer and what kind of settings that we use for Alpha. Um, think it, I'm thinking. Yeah, I'll do some more videos on kind of breaking down the actual shots, camera movement and that type of stuff and tricks that I kind of learned and hacks to make doing a bunch of shots a little bit easier on yourself because you know it takes a lot of time but there's ways to kind of expedite things and make certain things easier it's kind of just a look at the timeline and uh yeah i hope that you know gave you some clear direction on path trace feel free to uh comment and ask any other questions happy to keep making some videos on this and uh keep breaking it down and yeah, sorry again about the voice. COVID rocked me, so probably sounded pretty funny. But appreciate it, guys. And yeah, see ya.